What I thought we could start out with is having you talk about some of your earliest re memories of um, textiles as a child, either seeing them or making them. When I was a child, my grandmother, my, my father's mother, was uh, an embroiderer and a crocheter. And every Christmas, our gift from her was an embroidered something, tea towels for our hope chest. And I have to admit, mm -hmm. as a child, yeah. um, it wasn't as appreciated as now as an adult. I still have a full-size um, tablecloth that she crocheted that was on our dining room table as a child. And my job was to take the cloth off and to uh, wax the table, which we now have in our home. We have that table in, in our home. Um, but my mother was a seamstress, and we, we were children of the Depression. And so, uh, not that I experienced it, but probably, just after the Depression, my parents had gone through it. So we were taught to sew at a very early age. And one of my favorite memories is my mother was going to make me a, I love color, it's just going to make me a beige and powder blue with a fine yellow striped plaid jacket. And so she didn't want to ruin matching the plaid, so she took a night school class in tailoring. And I went to school with her, and I had a little doll at the time. It was a dressmaker's toy doll, and I dressed my doll. And I remember that the, the sleeves, the, the issue was how could we turn the sleeves, because apparently I, my mother would stitch them. I don't remember stitching it. But the teacher was quite impressed that I had the patience to make this little doll. How old were you? A nine. And when I was a child, a baby, uh, I think, I don't really know the story. I never thought to ask my mother the story. Um, she appliqued a sunbonnet Sioux, yellow and blue quilt, uh, for, not a really a quilt, but a coverlet, for my sister and my beds. And um, they were tied with yarn. And those two pieces were given to my daughter and my daughter literally loved them to death. There is no remains of those. So that yellow and blue combination was uh, probably my earliest recollection of color. You also commented earlier that you thought that weaving was a much more mechanical process. It is. Weaving involves, um, uh, similar to playing the organ, it involves hands and feet coordination, eye coordination. And it also makes noise. It's, there's a clacking sound as you draw the beater towards you. And it's, it's very rhythmical. You're sliding back and forth on the bench, and you're using your feet, and you're using your hands. And your, your mind is free to recreate other things. So it's a, it's a mechanical thing. But you can't talk. If somebody comes in to disturb you, you're in the middle of a pattern. Let's say it's a 16 harness thing you're doing. You, you don't bother me. So the only time you interact with people is when you take it off the loom. And then you're doing the hand finishing. So I found that it was too confining to me. And I also, I like to refer to the tail of Silas Marner. It's a very miserly thing you're doing. You're constant. So I had kids around. And if they're calling me and saying, Mom, come quick. Wait a minute. I'm, I, I, I'm finishing this last repeat where, where um, I, I read enough about quilt making and the history of quilt making. I read books on it. Um, that it was a sharing. It was a community thing. Get together and have a quilting bee. Talk about your family over the quilt. And I thought, well, this is obviously going to be much more sharing if I... And I, my first love was textiles. I mean, feeling things. And actually, I felt a whole lot of textiles in my life because I'm attracted to that between my thumb and my fingers, that feel. What do you think makes a good quilt? What makes a good quilt? In, from whose point of view? That's a good answer. Because what makes a good quilt for me is what I received from making the quilt. What makes a good quilt for you might be something else. Then how is it... Um, how do you feel about judging quilts when you're asked to judge? Um, when I'm asked to judge a quilt, I look at 
uh, workmanship, of course, but I'm not as tough as other judges on workmanship mm -hmm. because I want to know if this quilt moves me. If I'm going to pick a judge's choice, that quilt has to speak to me. I have to be able to tell a story about that quilt. And those are the quilts that I like the best. When I look at a funky quilt, I call them, you know, unstructured quilts. When I look at those quilts and I say, what was this lady thinking? That's the quilt that I like. I don't want to want look at one that says, oh yeah, she's real good at cutting out perfect patches. So when I judge them, I'm looking at that. I'm looking at what moves me. What is it visually up close and from a distance that attracts me to it? And that's the same thing with, um, with any art form. I, I mean, I'm in your face kind of thing, and then I like to draw back and look at it. Now, your wearables, were those designed for everyday use or special occasions? Well, now the question is, everyday use or special <laughs> occasions? You have to put yourself back into the 70s. And yes, we wore them every day. But uh, nowadays, they're looked upon as hippie dresses. But back then, we wore them. They were long dresses. And I because I was a weaver and I knew nothing about color, I mean, I told you my one lesson was two threads together. I invested in fabrics woven by other cultures. I started buying textiles because at our conferences, our weavers' conferences, we would have vendors. You have to remember, put this in perspective. The Peace Corps had just come back. They had brought all these textiles from all over the world. And I thought if I could buy these textiles, I could learn color because these colors put together by people who had not gone to art school, but who had done it out of a love of color. That was my education. So I, I learned to weave and put color together by looking at other people's textiles. You were doing hand weaving, and then you are not doing it now. So can you talk about that transition at all? In 1980, because I was on the board of the local uh, hand weavers association the whole of northern california it was my responsibility to see that the conference was successful when it returned to our area in eight years and so that involved you know selecting the chairman and overseeing the events and i literally experienced the ultimate burnout during that experience it was in april of, of 1980 and basically i was more involved of putting more things together more texture more embellishment, more wrappings, and the structure of the weavers at that time was, no, it had to be warp and weft. And I wanted to make a wearable uh, that was uh, bounced off of a patchwork thing. And so I, cu I quit at April, April the 28th, 1980, at 8.30 in the morning. And on April the 29th, I started writing pieced clothing. So I literally closed the door, sold everything, I said to my kids, I'm not going to sell the looms because you guys might want them. They all said, no, we would hated that machine that you, you were tied to, literally. And so I sold all that. I had people bidding on it. It was a great loom. Um, I still have a couple sewing machines, I mean, uh, spinning wheels, but I, I didn't drag them with me. I didn't bring them into my new environment. 